I, um, I think I'm, I drew the short, the short straw uh, on our committee to uh, make the opening remarks and set the context for, I think, the discussion, uh, the rich discussion that I hope we have today about whether or not there is value in all of the um, government agencies participating together in a coordinated national strategy for genomic medicine, and if so, how we might proceed. And I thought I'd do this by maybe highlighting a couple of other nation's uh, efforts in this regard and, you know, see if we could stimulate ourselves to think about doing something perhaps similar or perhaps even different. And, uh, do I control the slides? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So as Rex said, I'm not going to um, repeat what he said about the last uh, series of GM meetings. Just safe to say that it's, it's been an amazing 23 months when you think about it, how productive uh, this effort has been, um, ranging from a, a real grassroots um, uh, an issue, series of initiatives that many um, medical centers have undertaken without the benefit of, uh, of federal support and now with some benefit of federal support uh, to leading to the, uh, the demonstration projects, uh, two RFAs from NHGRI, um, the, uh, the inter-society group that Rex mentioned, and I hope um, that this GM5 will be as productive as the last uh, series of GMs and in, in, in coalescing around some tangible deliverables. Um, being somewhat of a genome nerd, I thought I'd also put it in this context that 23 or 24 months ago, there were a number of activities going on uh, fairly independently, um, an array of genome, genomic medicine activities across the nation. And through GM1 through GM4, we've really organized these into some sort of cohesive map of activities that, uh, where we recognize some common themes that cut across many of the organizations of this, in this room, and I think our aspiration is that we might actually coalesce this into a more orchestrated series of network activities. I think there's a lot of potential networks that could be derived from this and hopefully we will engage many of you in, in those discussions in the coming uh, day and a half. Uh, as I see it, the opportunity um, uh, for this group is to really think about how we accelerate the implementation of uh, genomic medicine, genomics research findings where it is appropriate to do so to improve uh, the quality of healthcare, uh, to also um, to create some standards where, where they often don't exist about implementation, about outcome measures um, across the various agencies that are uh, playing in this field, um, and also to coordinate a number of the implementation initiatives that we'll hear about over the next uh, day. Um, think about how we might engage the private sector, which has been significantly absent from uh, GM1 uh, through 5, um, and also, um, also think about the future workforce uh, needs that we will uh, have in order to uh, really realize the, uh, our, our common goals. I thought I'd, also, I thought I'd discuss a little bit um, what the United Kingdom has been doing, and um, the House of Lords uh, implemented or uh, set in motion a human genomic strategy group uh, several years ago to articulate uh, the UK's overarching strategy in genomic medicine to monitor the field and think about where what was ripe for implementation to build the necessary strategies to ensure effective and efficient translation and importantly to uh, create the infrastructure that will allow genome sciences as well as genomic medicine uh, to take hold and also to put in place a series of national genetic testing laboratories that would help serve the uh, needs of the, uh, of, of the British population. Uh, to work on training uh, the uh, NHS uh, and the UK workforces to realize these goals, uh, to be uh, cognizant of the um, policy and eth ethical and legal uh, strategies that would be needed, and to also um, act, uh, actively engage the public uh, and make them aware of the potential benefits of genomic medicine. And I would argue that uh, certainly uh, these uh, probably harmonize a lot with our aspirational goals collectively of the the, the, the groups in this room. Um, in their report, which was released in January of 2012, they put in, uh, set to motion, I think, a fairly bold vision that within the next seven years, um, uh, the, uh, the National Health Service would be a dominant force in enabling genomic medicine, uh, as well as to uh, 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 diffuse and, and uh, embrace the technologies of genomics for the betterment of public health. Uh, that um, this type of information would be, uh, you know, would be tantamount to medicine, not just genomic medicine, but it would be essentially pr um, practiced as medicine with a, a very engaged and knowledgeable healthcare workforce as well as a very engaged and knowledgeable uh, public. 
Now, arguably, um, the United States is quite a different uh, healthcare uh, and uh, system than, um, than the UK. Um, they have the benefit of a, a highly centralized healthcare delivery system in the National uh, Health Service, as well as um, initiatives that have uh, gone on for, for many years to centralize uh, both the data as well as the electronic medical records in that system. They've also, as I've mentioned, de uh, developed a, a number of uh, key um, infrastructure uh, initiatives to support genetic testing across the UK, and probably not too um, uh, uh, different than us, a very strong uh, 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 university system uh, with, with a, a number of um, premier investigators in the genomics field, uh, as well as um, uh, a key component of infrastructure, which is the UK Biobank. Now, um, the UK Biobank actually started um, uh, several years before the uh, the Human Genome Strategy Group uh, really put its uh, plans in motion, but I think it's a, it really illustrates the uh, the the power and the um, and the foresight as well as the fortitude of of the UK in creating such an initiative. As you may recall that Francis Collins, uh, I think, attempted to create a, a gene and environmental cohort of about 500,000 several years ago, uh, which uh, failed to get off the ground. But um, uh, nonetheless, the UK has um, started this in 2006. Uh, 62 million pounds, which I believe at that time was about $150 million. They completed the enrollment of 503,000 participants in four years uh, with uh, highly detailed sociodemographic, clinical, and environmental phenotypes. They've recently committed to 10 million pounds to um, analyzing the genomes of, of series of subsets of this cohort and have also um, received funding to uh, uh, put in uh, imaging data into as as part of the phenotypic data into into the um, into the biobank uh, database. And uh, as of March of 2012, they opened up this as a resource to uh, genome science investigators with about 20 projects now well underway. So I expect that we'll hear more about uh, discoveries about uh, genetic predisposition, gene environment, gene environment interactions from this incredible um, uh, resource in the UK. Uh, um, David Cameron uh, announced in December uh, the, um, the commitment to sequence uh, 100,000 British genomes uh, to really enable both sequencing at scale for the National Health Service, really help that service, that system understand how to integrate uh, genomic sequencing information uh, into uh, its, its electronic uh, record system, how it would be represented, but importantly, how that information might impact health outcomes. So this is a very much an outcomes-oriented uh, 1,000, 100,000 uh, genomes projects, which will, I'm sure, catalyze uh, a number of other uh, corollary um, initiatives, uh, both in terms of the types of skill sets that will be uh, required to deliver on this, as well as um, uh, discoveries that will be made um, across uh, the cancer, rare diseases, and other uh, common complex diseases. Now, also uh, aligned with this is a significant um, investment in creating the future workforce for the UK, uh, importantly with national oversight, something that I think, uh, as was highlighted by GM4, is somewhat lacking uh, in the United States, um, with a clear priori priority to uh, deliver bioinformatics bioinformatic and statistical and quantitative skill sets will be needed to uh, tackle the kinds of data that will be coming from genomic medicine initiatives and expanding uh, the specialist capacity of, of genetics and genomics to uh, all, to both primary care as well as uh, uh, specialty care, as well as investment in uh, innovative learning tools to disseminate the knowledge and keep the workforce uh, up to date. Another country that I think has um, made a significant investment in this, as well as made significant progress uh, in this arena, has been Canada. Genome Canada was an organization started more than a decade ago, both to provide infrastructure to the country of Canada in terms of genome technologies and centers that would be enabling to a variety of investigators and healthcare delivery systems. I think many of you in the room have probably sat on Genome Canada review uh, panels uh, to help them uh, decide which, which, which projects to go forward and which uh, not to. Uh, in, and in collaboration with the uh, CIHR, which is the NIH equivalent in, in Canada, they had um, put out this Genomics and Personalized Medicine RFA last year uh, to the tune of about $160 million of investment that would be 
in part from Genome Canada and CIHR and in part from industry. So 17 projects were funded in 2013, roughly at $10 million apiece. And these were heavily oriented towards implementation and outcomes research. So you can see here are some of the projects that received funding um, this year. Um, using mutations to guide therapy for pediatric glioblastoma, measuring clinical outcomes. Comparative effectiveness of different technologies for non-invasive prenatal testing. Uh, uh, sequencing of lymphomas to guide therapy with cost-effective analyses uh, baked in. The use of biomarkers to diagnose and treat exacerbations of COPD, again, guiding therapy and measuring outcomes. Real-time surveillance of HIV patients, monitoring drug resistance, and actively changing therapies on the basis of genomic information from both the host and from the pathogen. So I think this gives you a flavor of the kinds of investments that uh, Canada is making in specific projects that are meant to really prove the, the value, the clinical utility of a lot of genomic technologies that have been discovered by many, uh, many of you in the room as well as others across the globe. Now, I also wanted to take this as an opportunity to highlight a group that won't be um, speaking here today, but uh, I'm, as, as well as several of you, are on the Institute of Medicine's roundtable uh, for translating genomic-based research for health. I want to acknowledge Adam Berger, who you met earlier, who has been uh, one of the internal leaders. He's a senior program officer for this, um, for this roundtable, which began around 2006 and 2007 to uh, really begin to think about what strategies might be necessary for effective translation. Um, as you know, um, many of you, from uh, working with the IOM, it's a neutral convener. It has this capacity, as this group now uh, seems to have, of really bringing together many, many stakeholders in this, in this arena from government, academia, industry, uh, as well as uh, uh, non-government organizations. And the charge of this particular roundtable was to really explore define and maybe refine some of the strategies that might be used to improve the translation of genomic information into healthcare. Uh, we began uh, in 2007 with three different work streams, one related to diagnostics, the second related to uh, drug development, the third related to public health, all centered around the theme of genomics, genetics, and genomic information. This is the current composition of the roundtable, and I think you can see um, it's widely represented from both academia, um, uh, professional organizations, integrated healthcare delivery systems, uh, industry, uh, s some journals, uh, the military, uh, a very nice uh, cross-section, I think, of the stakeholders that are extremely interested in uh, moving genomics um, information into healthcare uh, and healthcare delivery. Uh, as I mentioned, molecular diagnostics was one of the main focal areas. I would say that over the last three or four years, there have been at least 12 to 14 workshops, I may be missing a few here, that have uh, focused on, uh, you know, really articulating some of the uh, challenges and barriers and the strategies to overcome them. Uh, this one was led by Deborah Leonard, uh, this particular focus area in molecular diagnostics, and you can see the products of three of the workshops that took place over the last several years. Uh, highlighting the need and the strategies for evidence generation, for uh, um, in, enforcing the, the notion of clinical utility of diagnostic testing, as well as the path to, to, uh, uh, to delivery of diagnostics, uh, particularly highlighting the regulatory coverage and reimbursement challenges uh, and strategies. And I should mention that each of these uh, uh, proceedings are available through the NAS uh, uh, website, and I think uh, if, you, if you're are truly interested in receiving copies, for whatever reason, you might want to talk to Adam uh, during the break. Uh, I led the uh, drug discovery and development, uh, genomics-enabled drug discovery and development uh, workshop uh, or focus groups, uh, working group, I should say, which uh, has had three um, workshops and a fourth that will happen uh, later next month, um, one about the designing the frameworks for pre-competitive collaborations between industry uh, and academia. Uh, genome-based strategies for targeted uh, uh, therapeutics development, uh, the concepts of data sharing, clinical data sharing and biospecimen uh, sharing, and uh, drug repurposing, a genomics-enabled drug repurposing workshop, which will take place, as I said, in, uh, on June uh, 24th um, here in D.C. Uh, the, uh, the Genomic Medicine and Public Health Group, which uh, was spearheaded by Muin as well as uh, uh, Bruce Blumberg and others, um, uh, focused on 
early on the implementation strategies for diffusion of technologies, understanding which genome technologies might provide the greatest value, and importantly, um, uh, where health IT needs to be in the future, as well as what are some of the economic frameworks that are important to consider in thinking about uh, enabling genomic technologies to, uh, to move to the fore. So um, I think one of the questions we struggle with at the IOM is what does his impact be? It, it clearly has elevated the dialogue across uh, the stakeholder community. There's no question about that. It has fostered collaboration, some that have actually resulted in uh, initiatives such as the com clinical trial comparator arm partnership, uh, looking at control trials from, and genomic data and biospecimens from control trials of, of um, industry-led clinical trials. Uh, there have been a number of uh, connections between the policy messages of, of the IOM and a number of policy initiatives even that at the, the NIH and several groups in the room have undertaken, and clearly the IOM is, is a resource. I would argue that one of the things we might want to achieve in the future, not necessarily for this meeting, is to make the IOM much more connected to many of the stakeholders uh, and, and have an efferent arm of activity that might uh, help move some of the IOM's uh, uh, statements forward in, in the field of uh, uh, genomics and genomic medicine. I just wanted to mention that uh, in the coming year, we've, uh, we've dis we're slowly disbanding the three focus groups that uh, I just mentioned, and we're going to be spending our time on conflict of interest, on education, on the notion that a, re that a healthcare system can actually be a learning health system for uh, genomic and precision medicine, and the processes for evidence evaluation when it comes to genetics and genomics. So in closing, I, I just also wanted to highlight the fact that, and I, that I, I think that, um, that w what we have in the room, represented by many of you, is an ecosystem that's really thinking about how to optimize the synergies between one another, reduce the redundancies, and really um, perhaps create a more effective series of strategies when it comes to genomic medicine. And um, one way, at least, that I thought about to frame this a little bit and you can disagree, is uh, to take uh, um, from the, the, the songbook of Muin, uh, you know, who has really helped us, along with the IOM and the CDC, articulate what are the different barriers to translating genomics from the laboratory on the left to healthcare-related outcomes on the right. And you can see the four traditionally now um, iconic barriers from T1 to the T4 highlighted here. And I would say that each of the groups in the room is playing in, uh, along uh, this translational uh, continuum with, uh, for example, the NIH and NHGRI, much more in the realm of thinking through how to overcome the barriers to moving the science into man for the first time, the T1 and the T2 spaces, whereas perhaps the VA and the CDC and some of the groups in ARC are really focused on uh, thinking about how does genomics get diffused into um, the hands of the providers and professionals that need to know how to use those tools to treat patients, as well as how do we measure, importantly measure, the outcomes that demonstrate the value proposition for the entire community, not just the patients, the providers, the payers, um, um, but the whole health healthcare delivery system as a whole. And I think one of the opportunities we have today is to really think about how to perhaps better organize this uh, such that we, uh, as, a, as a team of, of federal agencies can, can be more effective. So um, uh, maybe to echo some of the things that both uh, uh, Rex, uh, Terry, and Eric said, I think what we are here to do is try to understand uh, your issues in where you're focused in, in the area of genomic medicine, what are your major challenges in enabling this strategy, and then through that dialogue perhaps achieve some hopeful consensus about whether a strategy is really the way we should, uh, a, a coordinated strategy is something that we should consider going forward, and if so, what would, what, what would be our priorities, um, what may be some of the obstacles and challenges that we might choose to take on together, and what would um, some tangible next steps be um, at the close of the meeting. So with that, I'll stop and maybe take some questions or whatever our chairs would like us to do. Yeah, let's have some comments or questions. So, uh, Carolyn Clancy, Ark, just uh, thank you for a lovely presentation. Um, I downloaded the Cliff Notes version of the UK strategy um, late last week, and one thing I noted was that, at least in the Cliff Notes version, it really puts a great deal of emphasis on equity. And I would think, as government agencies working together, that we would want to retain that focus as well, particularly as our country gets more diverse. 
Yeah, and, and, and the notion of making sure that, uh, if I understand the, the term equity, that we're not, um, we're really addressing how genomics might uh, create disparities in, yes. in medicine. Yes, absolutely. So I was um, uh, interested both for the UK and for Canada, um, and I don't know if you're going to know the answer, and we have a lot of military colleagues here, maybe they know the answer. In those two countries, where, does the military get their health care on their own, or are they part of, especially like in the, in the UK, part of the NHS? And the reason I'm asking that question is I'm curious if the activities that you described yeah, will naturally sweep in the military or whether it's a situation like we have here where there might be different things going on in different parts of the country. And I would just like to look by analogy, try to see whatever lessons might be learned there. It's a great question. I actually don't know. Um, what because NHGRI says, has yeah. had several, actually multiple conversations yeah. with different parts, in fact, some of the people at this meeting, um, of different parts of the military to try to coordinate or just learn from mm -hmm. each other. And so it's an area that we're very interested in, and I just wanted to see if there was any lessons that could be learned. I mean, in the UK, for example, I mean, does anybody know if the military gets their medical care from the National Health Service there? Yeah, the uh, UK and Canada both rely on the civilian sector for the predominance of their care. So, so we're different in that way. Oh, we're very different. Very different. <laughs> I know we're very different. <laughs> okay, thanks. Great. Well, and if I could just comment that it, it seems as though, in a way, the, the military medical systems may be a sort of a little NHS in, in and of themselves. And so, so in, in some way, I mean, you know, looking at us sort of from the outside looking in, even though I, I, I do practice over at Walter Reed, um, it, do you see yourselves as, as being a, a little bit more flexible and a little bit more perhaps in control of the kinds of things you do, un, unlike um, trying to tackle the entire U.S. civilian health care system? Uh, Ma'am, I would address one aspect of that is, and that is a lot of what we do is operationally related in terms of support to whatever mission. So if it relates to optimal performance under the sea, in the air, or on it, those are issues that we would first prioritize. Then there's the beneficiary aspect, which includes the dependence of the military, and that is a much more broader spectrum of care that's provided in the MTFs. But if your question is, do we target certain areas of those beneficiary care um, um, sector, I'm not aware we do. Uh, did you want to answer? Yes, sir. Thank you. Once again, I'm John Forsberg from Naval Medical Research Center. We, uh, over the last decade or so, have been uh, collecting genomic information from wounded service members and translating that information from wound biopsies, serum, uh, and also pathogenic uh, uh, information into clinical decision support models. Now, one of the uh, one of the main challenges we see is integrating those models, uh, similar to the the challenges in the civilian community, into usable interfaces that clinicians can actually use. And one of the one of the barriers really is our electronic medical record. So, so uh, maybe that could be one focus area for this group to address. And I know the VA system also has a very robust electronic medical record. Uh, and it seems to me that these would be amenable to uh, decision support uh, uh, applications, but you'd be surprised as to how many challenges arise as you go forward. We wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think this, this short conversation highlights the fact that the military is, um, has health care delivery challenges for, the, uh, for their personnel and, the pers and their families. Um, just as much as uh, a place like Duke or Geisinger have uh, to deliver health care to uh, their patient population. So uh, while it's not, to Eric's point, the military is not part of, um, is not receiving care in, in the public sector as it is perhaps in the UK, I think one of the common themes we'll hopefully see is that uh, military health care delivery systems are, have, are similarly challenged and have similar inefficiencies, but also some great capabilities that might help inform some of the other um, programs, uh, you know, in the, in the public sector. I'd really like to uh, echo the comment that was made about uh, decision support and actually several un other NHGRI funded projects are exploring, such as the Emerge Network, are exploring exactly how do you put uh, genomic information into electronic health records, provide decision support for uh, physicians. And uh, so I think there's, a, there's already a common basis for some really interesting interactions. Yeah, just to continue on that theme, I mean, one of the under, 
underlying principles for um, trying to do this in electronic health records is standardization. And it's been somewhat difficult uh, to move, at least through the Office of the National Coordinator, uh, given their priorities relating to meaningful use, some of the standards that are going to be necessary to support represented, uh, representing genomic information in uh, data warehouses that can be accessed by electronic health records in order to drive clinical decision support. If there were a group, uh, hint, hint, uh, that could uh, that could actually uh, take some of the nascent standards that have been developed by groups like HL7 and some of the others and actually make that into an operational standard, I think the uh, there would be a lot of enthusiasm uh, uh, beyond that to uh, adopt since we're really desperate for uh, standards that everybody can use which will uh, ultimately be needed if we're going to uh, have interoperability because the one thing that is different about uh, genomics than uh, most other healthcare data is that it's persistent. And so we need to have information that can follow the patient really throughout a lifespan uh, so that that information can be reused in an efficient manner. I might also comment, as, as Rex did, that, that uh, Emerge has been working in this space, a number of other groups are as well. But, but Mark, you're, you, there's a, apparently a Clinical Decision Support Society that I just, I just learned of, but uh, others might want to know about it. Yeah, the Clinical Decision Support Consortium actually is an AHRQ-funded um, uh, activity that is in its uh, third and final year of uh, supplemental funding, so it is uh, about to sunset. Um, it's uh, led by Blackford Middleton, who's now at Vanderbilt, and over the course of the last year, the EHR integration group, which is uh, a part of eMERGE, uh, has been um, collaborating with the Clinical Decision Support Consortium around some of the issues related to genomic medicine. Geisinger is also a member of the CDSC, so I've sort of been the um, go-between. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the uh, projects, sub-projects of this uh, Clinical Decision Support Consortium has been one related to pharmacogenomics. And so I've been sitting on that group, uh, and they will be uh, uh, putting out a, a paper including some uh, cl clinical decision support artifacts for two uh, uh, pharmacogenomic use cases, um, and that will be appearing uh, in the very near future since they are sunsetting, I think, as of the end of June. Um, the issue there, as with many of the types of things that we talk about, is the sustainability. There's a lot of good work being done, but then how do we keep this going, you know, when uh, the uh, seed funding uh, from the, uh, in this case, the federal government uh, goes away? What's the business case to kind of keep this going? So while there's a lot of enthusiasm, uh, we really haven't developed a sustainability model, although the hope is, is that with uh, uh, Blackford at Vanderbilt uh, uh, that is uh, intimately involved in eMERGE and others that we can begin to at least take some of the work that they've done and piggyback that uh, into the work that eMERGE is doing and move uh, forward a little bit faster. It's not all about uh, decision support either. I wonder if there were any other uh, comments from anyone before we moved on. Jeff? Okay. No, thank you. No? Do you want something to say? Brad? Can I just ask on the, on the, the as these big health systems get tied in, like, like the UK project, uh, do you know if, are they also tackling the, the, the conundrum of returning results in a big research project like this? I mean, we always have a little trouble. Yeah. <laughs> a little trouble. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I cannot speak to the specifics. The answer is yes, but I can't tell you where they are with that, that, that dialogue. And I think this will be part of, you know, and we alluded to the fact that there will be an international uh, meeting uh, coming in the fall, um, and a number of these themes that will be brought up today, I think, or that you've brought up and others uh, will be part of that discussion as well. Carolyn? So I guess the last point I'd like to make for, on your T1 through T4, I don't see how we get to identifying true benefit unless we have payers and um, others as part of this dialogue. Researchers absolutely can't do this alone, and my apologies to Eric who's heard me uh, say this before. It doesn't matter how great the genomic interventions are. Um, they're going to be lost in a uh, messed up system, which is what we have at the moment. So to that extent, I don't think it's too early to be anticipating what venues we might be exploiting to engage that voice. I might just add to that for information purposes that as an outgrowth of, uh, I think it was GM3, 
Uh, there was a meeting actually convened by NHGRI with payers that happened uh, last October. Um, and so there is some work being done that's followed up on that. I, I think it's, it's a very important point. It's a critical stakeholder that we've got to engage fully or we're not going to succeed. Total, totally agree, and, and we're going to hear an update on that later uh, in this meeting. Uh, and also, we have the benefit of Naomi being here representing uh, a very important pair of constituencies, so hopefully uh, there are at least ears and maybe a voice at the table um, uh, for your point, Carolyn. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> just want to follow up on uh, uh, some of the discussion. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad this meeting is happening because it's taking uh, almost 15 years um, where we had a sort of a number of similar efforts in the past, but I think the time is right <clears throat> because of the, uh, the sequence being available. Um, <clears throat> I think the issues around equity, the issues around evidence, the issues around payers, I mean, we've kind of uh, been exploring them. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask um, <coughs> Jeff and others, I mean, how do we see this kind of interaction going on between the feds? Because in the past, <clears throat> we had advisory committees like uh, SACGT, SACGHS, <clears throat> and it's all um, sort of uh, in a way to uh, not force, but get the, the federal partners together <clears throat> because they all have one boss, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, and those attempts were done in the past, <clears throat> and those committees have come and gone and now have been replaced by uh, non-binding groups like IOM. Uh, <clears throat> the groups, uh, newborn screening, for example, which is an arm of uh, genetics and public health, have organized their world around their, their own secretary's advisory committee that essentially decides what, uh, what tests should be included in the newborn screening panel or recommended for the 50 states. So, you know, it's easy to implement genomic medicine <clears throat> in the context of Canada and the UK because of their um, healthcare system. It's much more complicated to do it here um, given that researchers are doing the research and <clears throat> payers are not paying for these services and the evidence is lost in between. So one of the things we need to explore is how would that interaction look like as we move forward? Well, I think that's, a, that's an excellent um, uh, theme for this meeting, Muin. I, I mean, I, I think we, uh, we recognize that there are lots of differences between the U.S. and some of the uh, countries that I, that I mentioned. Uh, I don't want to presuppose the outcome of this meeting, but it could be something around uh, a constitution of genomic medicine that, uh, that harmonizes the, the various states, if you will. But um, I, I was really pleased that in uh, the last meeting that we took a lot of uh, fairly independent and uh, potentially competing groups, if you want to look at it that way, and really coalesced them into a, into a coordinating society around the professional organizations. Maybe we could do something along those lines. But I think that's the topic for this afternoon um, that, we'll, that Rex and, and Eric will, will lead um, is really to take the information from this meeting and begin to drive it with a fine point on, uh, to, on the exact issue you raised. So thanks for bringing it up again. Jeff, uh, as you and I have discussed, uh, one of the stakeholders that's, uh, that was central in the Canadian effort is the is ph pharmaceutical industry and the sort of the, an industry more broadly in terms of uh, developing biomarkers, uh, commercializing discovery that, uh, that individual academic laboratories make. And it occurs to me that, that we ha that's a constituency that probably needs to be at, at this table or some table, and we haven't, we as a GM advisory group haven't done that yet, but we probably need to add that yeah. to our to-do list. I agree. I, I mentioned it in passing, but I think we need to do more than a passing mention of it. All right, I think uh, we should move on, um, but this is actually a nice segue. Uh, the next presenter will be uh, Deborah Leonard, who's going to talk about the College of American Pathologists uh, genomic policy framework.